All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's Winter 2023 Lecture Series. We are so happy to have you all here with us today. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm Elizabeth York. I am the museum's executive director. Uh, today's lecture is sponsored by the Mid-Cape Cultural Council and the Massachusetts Cultural Council, as well as our 2023 corporate sponsors. Those are Cape Air, Highline Cruises, and Avangrid. Uh, a big thank you to their generous support of the uh, for their generous support of the museum. Uh, it's important and worth noting that programs like this lecture today are made possible by support from folks like yourselves watching here today. And I know that I sound like PBS or WGBH whenever I say that, but I really urge you to consider donating or becoming a member of the museum. Uh, your support helps us host programs like this and others. And I know there are several familiar faces here today, so you know the other programs that we do. So again, please consider donating and keeping these programs going. Uh, so before we get started, just a few reminders for our Zoom lecture format. Please be sure to keep your microphone on mute and your video off so that all of the attention can be on our speaker. If you run into any technical issues today, you can type, uh, you can send me a message via the chat. You can just type it right into the chat function and send it straight to me. Also, um, our uh, speaker will be taking questions at the end of his lecture, and you can type those questions either into the chat or in through the Q&A option. Um, and again, you can write them at any time. Uh, our speaker will be taking questions at the end, though. So today's lecture is uh, brought to you by Jesse Meckling. He is the Director of Marine Education at the Center for Coastal Studies. And he informed me earlier that he's been with the center for 14 years, which is so impressive. Um, so Jesse, feel free to take it away and tell us all about uh, you know, our, our oceans and marine plastics. All right, well, can everyone hear me? Is it everyone's good? Sound great. All right, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for uh, allowing me to, to have the opportunity to talk to something um, uh, that I'm passionate about. Um, plastic pollution, something I've been working on uh, actually since I started at the center a little before we, and we now have a, um, uh, well, it's called a marine debris program, but actually a specific person, Laura Ludwig, who actually works just on um, marine debris and plastic pollution. And some of the data that I'll share with you is from some, some cleanups, but I've been involved with this uh, since I've been at the center. And um, is my screen share showing? Everyone can see the screen, hopefully. So, uh, Looks great. Okay, perfect. So um, once I, I, I start the presentation, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna um, take off my video because I was pausing before and I don't want to have to you know I don't want to pause and then get stuck in mid sentence and not know that I'm you all can't hear me so once I start um, but really today uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, titled the trouble with plastic pollution and there's a lot of trouble with plastic pollution um, not only in our uh, in our oceans uh, but in as we'll see in our own bodies, um, and I, I routinely before I get so I routine just to I routinely um, uh, engage in beach cleanups, and we have visiting groups sometimes that come where we looking for community service projects that we um, engage with beach cleanups, and may, maybe many of you out there have I don't know if any of you have been on cleanups with me or with other folks or with folks at the center or, or lead your own cleanups, but. Um, there's a group that comes up every year of high school seniors from a school in North Carolina. And we've been doing a cleanup with them for years. And this, this year, um, uh, Laura and I, um, we split up. The, it's a huge, it's a big class, about 200 kids. We split up the kids and Laura said, well, what are you going to tell them? And I said, well, I'm not going to really beat around the bush and I'm going to tell them how it is. And, um, and I'll, I'll just say that to you all, that this is an existential problem for human life. Um, it's, it's, as we will see, um, this is a huge problem. Um, it's not just ocean life. It's now our lives that are being affected by it. So um, I'll try to stay positive. And I do have some, hopefully some, some sort of solutions at the end. Uh, but this is, this is a major problem uh, that the world's facing. Um, you know, sort of a, a side cousin of climate change because plastic comes from oil and uh, natural gas production. So it's 
you know, sort of a little side cushion of, of climate change, uh, but it is, um, it's actually an existential problem for the welfare of human life moving forward. So with that, um, I'm gonna, um, let's see, I can, I can see if I can get my face, but um, we'll just get started. Um, so I, I like to start with uh, this picture of the world uh, as being a marine educator to really remind us that we live on the blue planet. Um, you know, nearly 72% uh, of the Earth's surface is covered in ocean. Um, and this is an image actually of the Pacific Ocean. You could put uh, all the land masses in the Pacific Ocean with still ocean surrounding it. Um, and you know, our what we do on land, of course, greatly impacts the oceans. Uh, the oceans have been seen as a dump for for probably as long as humans have been alive. You know, you throw stuff in the ocean and the tide takes it away. Um, but of course, the tide comes back in someplace else and deposits it deposits it in another location, which now we, we, we all reside. Um, so what is uh, plastic pollution? Plastic pollution is basically um, plastic that gets into our environment. It's, it's most widely distributed in our oceans because the ocean is 71% of the Earth's surface. Um, but as we will learn, it's, it's actually everywhere. It's, it's in the air we breathe, um, and it's on pretty much every surface of the globe. Uh, so many of these pictures are images that I have taken myself in various places. Um, and I'll just mention um, that here on Cape Cod, we actually live in a very clean um, environment. Um, now, that being said, I can go out on any beach and in probably 20 minutes fill a trash bag full of trash. Um, but I've been in places in the world where literally you can sit and have the trash just wash in with every little wave and fill a trash bag in 10 minutes um, without even moving. Um, so um, it is prevalent everywhere. Um, if you see this picture, uh, I don't know if I can move the cursor there, you see that uh, green frisbee. I actually have that green frisbee um, somewhere in my garage. Um, this is from Mexico. Um, so plastic pollution is simply waste plastic that gets into the environment. Um, it is there. It can be virgin plastic, which is this is an image of something called a nurdle, which is what is a pre-plastic pellet. This is what all plastic starts out as, um, and then gets transformed into all the plastic that we we know today um, and we use today. Um, for for many years, actually, nurdles were quite common among groups uh, looking at plastics in the ocean, there has been, there has been quite a bit of work to, to sort of clean up, regulate, you know, um, the, the movement, the trans, it's really the transportation of neurons, because you can imagine that these things can easily, you know, if a bag falls out, um, and we'll see a picture of a couple billion that spilled from a cargo ship in, um, in Hong Kong a few years ago. Um, but much, much of the plastic that makes its way that we find in our environment today is plastic that has been used and then discarded, as opposed to this, which had never been you know, used in the first place. So um, what is the top plastic out there? Uh, the Ocean Conservancy is an uh, international NGO. They've been doing uh, cleanups. They sponsor the International Beach Cleanup, which happens every September around the world. Um, and they've been doing cleanups for, I think, close to 30 years. Um, this is just uh, their top 10. Um, again, this is, this is around the world. Um, this is mostly coasts. Um, so that caveat, you know, as opposed to what you find out in the middle of the ocean, this is mostly coasts because uh, most of the cleanups are happening along the coasts, the beaches. But you can see, uh, this is from 2016. You can see um, from this uh, graph here that almost everything apart from cigarette butts is actually um, related to food. Uh, and if we look at the uh, 2017 numbers, uh, you can see that um, they're, they're quite similar. Um, again, cigarette butts is the number one um, item that they find uh, in the International Coast Cleanup. Um, cigarette butts actually are not, generally not that high um, on our, um, cleanups that we do on Cape Cod just because um, 
it's they're more rural beaches where we're getting debris that washes in. Um, and if you look at the sort of the latest figure uh, from 2022, this is the latest data I could find from them. Again, you can see that um, that really that the the top 10 items remain kind of the top 10 items, right? We have bottles, food wrappers, uh, bottle caps, grocery bags, straw stirs, takeout containers. A lot of the the waste that gets into our environment, uh, not surprisingly, is from food. Um, that's because food um, and plastic used to either take out food or wrap food or used to drink food with um, is is made for a very short time. You know, we're taking a an entity that is made to last forever and we're use, making it to use for five minutes um, with no other you know, no other use, you don't really reuse straws, um, and those readily make their way into our environment. Uh, just on the Cape, so this was a, a study that I conducted with an AmeriCorps volunteer in 2016, uh, just to give you an idea of what we, we find generally on the Cape, and this is looking at, we looked at four beaches, two Cape Cod Bay beaches and two Oceanside beaches. Um, we went out every week, um, sorry, uh, once a month for, for eight months. Um, and these are the percentages we found. So again, food related items were uh, the number one uh, item that we found on our, our cleanups. Not surprisingly, I guess, uh, fishing, fishing related debris is actually quite high on Cape Cod. Uh, you can see there about 17 or 17% of what we found was fishing debris. Related, uh, we do get a lot of fishing um, related debris, um, all of which is, is nearly made of plastic. So rope these days is made of plastic. Um, lobster traps are made of plastic. Almost everything you find fishing related is made of plastic um, as opposed to, you know, maybe 60, 60, 70 years ago where rope was made of hemp, um, is now made of plastic. And I just um, grabbed our totals from last year, from 2022. Uh, where we had 25 cleanups on the Cape, um, 24 on the Cape, one was on Plymouth, and uh, this was, these were the numbers of items we found. Um, I just put in the percentage there for cigarette butts and balloon strings because it's just about the same as our eight-month study. Um, and in total, um, center staff and, but mostly volunteers collected nearly 37,000 or nearly 38,000 pieces of trash. And well, that, it seems like a lot, actually, as I said, this is, our beaches are pretty clean beaches on Cape Cod. Um, I think the biggest cleanup I've ever participated in on Cape Cod was with AmeriCorps. We collected about 10,000 pieces in two hours um, at Herring Cove Beach in Provincetown. Um, so where does plastic pollution come from? Uh, well, plastic is not a natural, um, naturally uh, does not naturally exist in the environment in the world so it comes from us right is a man human made product it comes from people um, it comes from our waste um, it comes from in many ways uh, countries that have poor waste management uh, this is uh, some images of um, town in Indonesia actually on the um, Borneo the island of um, near Papua New Guinea, not Borneo, sorry, Papua New Guinea. And in many places in the world, right, there, there, there is very little waste management and people throw things in the sea. Um, of course, when you had, a, you had a banana leaf that was wrapping your food, that wasn't an issue, but now you have a plastic bag that's wrapping your issue, so it becomes, becomes an issue. Um, plastic pollution can get into the environment from storms. This is an image of uh, the 2011 tsunami. Uh, that hit Japan with you know terrifying uh, terrible effects it killed many thousands of people um, and of course took you know the, the the waves traveled very far inland and then of course took um, all that debris and trash back out into the sea within a few months that um, debris started washing up um, on shores in the US this is a Japanese fishing boat that was found in Alaska um, there was actually a full motorcycle, I believe, in a crate that was found in Alaska as well. Uh, but storms, and of course, storms, uh, you know, a storm, storms get stronger. Uh, it can, you know, just increase the amount of 
debris, trash, um, a lot of which is made of plastic, can get out into the oceans. Um, cargo containers, they, most of the world's um, materials, it's, I believe it's 98% of the world's materials travel by cargo containers. Um, and you can never get, you, there's, you, you can't really find out how many cargo containers are lost at sea because of course shipping companies don't want to tell you that. Um, I've read anywhere up to 10% of cargo is lost at sea due to storms um, or accidents. Um, and of course, the, the famous, there's the famous case of the, the rubber duckies that were lost um, in, in, um, in the Pacific uh, and made their way. It was actually more than duckies. It was little, there were four little toys. And um, there's a great book called Moby Duck that talks about this. And they were uh, those toys eventually made their way around to the Atlantic um, um, when they were spilled from a cargo ship. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the pre-industrial um, plastic pellets, uh, these nurdles, this was a, a, a three cargo containers carrying these nurdles going to Hong Kong spilled a number of years ago on these islands in Hong Kong. And you can see it was, it was like snow on the beaches. Um, you know, who knows how many untold numbers of those nurdles because probably in each cargo container there's I, I don't know I don't even wouldn't venture to guess you know trillions cotillions um but within 30 days of this happening the aquaculture industry in around Hong Kong had to actually cull all their fish because the fish were eating all these nurdles that looked like you know they looked like fish eggs and they actually had to cull all the fish around um in the fishing, um, the aquaculture industry around Hong Kong. So you can see here, they look very much like fish eggs, right? Very easily ingestible. Um, this plastic pollution comes from fishing. As I mentioned, we have a lot of fishing gear here, you know, in many parts of the world um, with artisanal fisheries, um, you know, uh, fishers that with, again, with no trash infrastructure, uh, with no waste infrastructure right when they're done with something they just throw it overboard or it gets lost due to storms um as happens here uh but traditionally that's that's always been a um you know throwing stuff overboard is it's been a tradition from for mariners for many many years uh centuries uh and in fact um about i believe it was 2016 was our first cleanup um our first cleanup the center conducted looking at uh, underwater fishing gear. So we actually went out with fishermen towing, um, dragging lines, and we would we would, we were we were looking for lost lobster gear. Um, we've we've since we've done this project a number of years, and we we now use sonar to actually identify where gear is, and we go and grapple this gear and bring it up. But the first year we were just out there grappling, and what we were told was. Um, it was just in Provincetown Harbor, and what we were told was uh, when boats used to come across, uh, come around Long Point into Provincetown Harbor, uh, draggers, they just used to, the stuff they didn't want anymore, they just literally threw overboard right there before get, they got to the harbor. So we didn't even have to, we just went in the same spot, and every time you dropped the grapple, you pulled up uh, a, a net, a line, a cable, something like that. So literally, the, as coming into Provincetown Harbor, they just literally used to just offload their their what they didn't need anymore. Um, again, this is an image of, of Cape Cod Bay uh, in the, you know, during lobster season, there's, we get lots of pieces, lots of waste coming from lobster industry, trap industry on Cape Cod. That's where most of our fishing debris comes from. Again, it comes from traps and lines getting lost um, in storms, getting cut, you know, maybe by other types of fishing and simply just being discarded, right? We have lots of little pieces of fishing debris. That's the only way you could describe it. It was a cut piece and it was probably just tossed overboard. Um, offshore oil platforms, of course, um, you know, things can come off of them. Uh, and aquaculture, as I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of aquaculture on Cape Cod, not fin fish like this, but we have shellfish aquaculture. and We do find um, debris coming from aquaculture bags, particularly. Um, netting um, that holds down the bags, um, but any any industry really in the sea can be a contributor uh, to plastic pollution. 
Uh, and of course, then there's the issue of microplastics. So plastics that get into the environment um, and become smaller um, is one of the major issues that we're uh, that with with plastic pollution and with marine plastic pollution. And microplastics actually can come from a number of different um, number of different uh, venues. Um, they can come from larger plastic pieces. Um, which quite often happens. They can be the nurdles themselves, as I mentioned, those pre, sort of pre-industrial plastic pellets. Um, increasingly, fibers. Um, so we're seeing we're seeing more fibers in our um, uh, in our actually in our plankton samples when we when the center we look at plankton, uh, we're seeing more fibers, uh, particularly um, also rope. So rope. As it sheds, it, it sort of creates these fibrous materials. But like clothing, clothing is a um, uh, non non natural clothes, so synthetic clo clothing. Um, every time you wash it, it creates fibers. Um, and if you live in a place with a wastewater treatment plant, it's uh, you know non septic. That it actually these fibers make it through the wastewater treatment plant and get out into the environment. Um, and then. Microbeads that were found in other personal hygiene products, although um, there there was a law that was passed limiting the number of microbeads in in personal care products in the U.S. a number of years ago, uh, although they are still prevalent in in other parts of the world. So um, you know, if you ever had um, a little facial cleanser that said you know micro scrubbers get your face super clean. Um, those were actually little pieces of plastic um, that, of course, would you would scrub your face with and then would go down the drain. Uh, toothpaste uh, quite often had little pieces of plastic in it that we'd brush our teeth with. Um, so other other avenues for plastic getting into the environment. So this figure is is an older figure. I'm not sure if there is actually a newer study that has come out um, on this, but this is the figure that is widely um cited um by um dr jambach uh which says that about eight uh, million tons of plastic enter the oceans each year um of course you know i've just been talking about all the ways that plastic gets into the ocean from from water um most of most of the plastic comes from land about 70 percent of plastic that enters the ocean uh, comes from land. Um, and as you can see here, uh, not surprisingly, it comes from um, uh, East Asia, China, and Southeast Asia with large populations uh, and uh, little waste infrastructure. Um, countries like Indonesia, um, Thailand, um, Vietnam here, um, you can see uh, a lot of waste enters the ocean. Um, from these countries, and part of the problem is we can see here that 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 the U.S. you know the U.S. is is kind of a dark blue. European countries are sort of a lighter blue. Part of the issue uh, with the the Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, and China um, prior to uh, 2019 was that we would ship a lot of our trash, uh, particularly our plastics, over to these countries to to China until China stopped. China refused taking our plastic. And then we switch to other countries like uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia. And so these countries that are already don't really have the capacity to deal with their own waste um, are also getting the waste of um, European countries and uh, America. And of course, you know, Americans, we produce more waste per person per capita than any other, um, any other nation. Um, and although we do have waste getting into the ocean from our country, um, these countries uh, in Asia aren't, you know, aren't to be to blame solely for it's not not only their trash, but it's other trash um, that comes from us and Europeans getting there. So where is plastic pollution found? Um, basically, uh, anywhere. Um, and everywhere it is now found anywhere and everywhere. Um, but in the oceans, it, it does um, tend to concentrate in certain areas called gyres. And a gyre is an area of the ocean. There's actually five gyres. There's a North Pacific, North, 
Atlantic, South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Ocean Gyre. And these are areas uh, where uh, currents that run uh, clockwise, you can see here along the equator or in the southern hemisphere, they run counterclockwise. They create these convergence zones where, so trash coming from Asia, Japan, Indonesia, all this area gets into the ocean, moves its way around, um, creates this um, in this convergence zone and sort of uh, ends up in these um, in these gyres. Uh, the the most famous being the North Pacific Gyre, which everyone uh, used to name the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, you know, various misinformation out there about you know piles of trash, and it's not really piles of trash. It's just it's little pieces of floating debris that you barely notice. Um, uh, and there's so much of it out there uh, that it, it's actually more than the stars in the universe. Um, and here is an image of sort of those gyres and these concentrations of plastic. Um, so sort of the white integrates the, so this is the North Pacific gyre, the South Pacific, or sorry, South Atlantic, North Atlantic, North Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Ocean gyre here. And in these gyres is where really, where you have the, the highest concentration of trash, of, of marine plastics. Um, but as I mentioned, it's found everywhere on the, from the top of Mount Everest to the depths of the Mariana Trench, um, from Arctic ice to, as I mentioned, to the air we breathe. Um, so I have been to, um, been fortunate that I've been to some very remote places in the world. Uh, this is one of them. This is an area off of Papua New Guinea. Um, and completely uninhabited islands, uh, spectator, spe spectacular coral reefs, um, and you go to a beach and it looks like this. Um, in fact, I remember the currents between the islands were quite strong and we went out uh, diving one day and there was just a line of trash. Now where this trash come from, it could have come from hundreds of miles away uh, or maybe even thousands of miles away. Uh, it's, not, it's probably not trash that they're generating, certainly not the island where we were staying was generating uh, because there were maybe only there was a village and and you know two or three places to stay on that island um but this is what happens this the trash moves around uh to various places uh this is trash found on um in south of playa del carmen in mexico um again this is the the image i showed before with the frisbee uh if you ever been to i've never been to cancun i've been to playa del carmen the beaches are quite um quite clean actually uh i don't know if people clean the beaches or what uh but if you go a little further south and these were beaches a little further south of tulum um and actually this is Acumel, which is just south of playa del carmen uh a turtle sanctuary uh this is where the, the trash was accumulating here um this is from a beach in the galapagos islands uh you can see all the microplastics there um, this beach was filled with sea lions and turtles and iguanas and all the life you find on the Galapagos um, and also all these microplastics. Uh, this is uh, an image, it's not my image, this is an image from Henderson Island, which is a remote island in the middle of the Pacific. It is uninhabited. It was found to be the dirtiest island in the world um, where they found 38 million pieces of plastic estimated at 17 tons. Uh, again, an island that is thousands of miles away from any humid habitation. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, th this is an image of plastic um, at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Um, it was, I guess not surprisingly, when researchers went down there um, not too long ago in a, a, or a submersible went down, um, they found plastic debris at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's, it's been found in Arctic ice, it's been found on the top of mountains, and um, it's been found in the air we breathe. Uh, not only that, it's found in many, um, it's made its way into many food products, uh, salt, um, sea salt being one of them, uh, honey, of course, seafood, water, um and not surprisingly with with plastic being found in all these different things um food uh and water that we we eat consume um recently 
uh, researchers have found that plastic has been found in our bloodstreams. Um, it was, uh, this is a, a, granted this paper was a small sample size, but in that, in the paper, they found that 77% of the people sampled had plastic pollution in their blood. Uh, we know it gets into organs, people's organs. Um, it's in our blood. Uh, a interesting story in 2011, uh, I attended a, I, I believe it was the second Marine Debris Conference. Um, and at that conference in 2011, microplastics were the big talk of the day, sort of the new, the new kid on the block, the new thing, the new talks, every, the talks that everyone wanted to go see was on microplastics. It was kind of this new, this, uh, new subject in the science of, of marine debris and plastics. Um, fast forward to 2017, uh, another marine debris conference that I was lucky enough to attend. Uh, six years later, this conference, um, we, we knew all about my, microplastics. Now we're, we're hearing talks about our plastics being found in, you know, human waste, um, looking at waste in various countries and finding plastic in human waste. Uh, I was not able to attend the, the, the most recent conference, which was last fall in Korea. Um, but my colleague, Laura Ludwig, uh, did, and, and the talk there was really about how much this has just proliferated, um, how much more plastic there is. Uh, but we've gone in, in 10 years time, 11 years time from really discussing, oh, this, there's this new stuff out there called microplastics. It's very small plastic. It's in the environment to it um, being found in our blood. So a very, very short period of time. Um, so what are the impacts of plastic pollution? Of course, uh, in the marine environment, we know what the impacts are quite well. Um, entanglements. Uh, so we, in Cape Cod, we have um, animals that get entangled um, quite often. Now, our entanglements on Cape Cod generally are from fixed, some fixed fishing gear. So gear that's being actively fished. So these are, um, you know, nets or or lines going down to traps that whales or and or turtles or seals run into um so it's not it's not a marine debris issue but in other parts of the world um particularly Ho hawaii is one of those spots australia is another spot they have lots of uh issues with ghost gear which is lost fishing gear but just because it's lost doesn't mean it stopped fishing so entanglement is a, a huge uh problem with um plastic pollution in the ocean Habitat destruction, um, you know, plastic can, can get on and smother corals. I've personally seen, I, in fact, I took this picture, um, uh, you know, I've personally seen plastic um, on top of corals, smothering corals, it can destroy habitat, it can also create habitat actually as well. Um, ingestion is probably the most insidious and I'm sure um, many of you have maybe seen the pictures um, of um, whether it be albatross, this is this is the albatross out on uh, Midway Island um, that ingest pla that are fed plastic by their parents. Um, if they're lucky enough, they're fed enough food that they can actually survive. But more than half of them don't. They're fed more plastic than anything else. Um, another one of these images, um, but it's it's not just birds, although it's estimated that nearly 97% of seabirds are, are ingest some type of plastic. It's um, over nearly 300 marine animals have been known to ingest plastic and that's everything from the blue whale down to microscopic, microscopic uh, zooplankton or animal plankton. Um, this is an image of um, what was taken out of a sea turtle. And um, this is a, a sperm whale that washed up in Spain. Uh, this was a few years ago. This is what was taken out of its stomach. Um, but I uh, I routinely get Google alerts on whale strandings, and um, every few weeks there's there's a stranding somewhere in the world where once they perform perform the necropsy on the whale, they find that its stomach was filled with plastic. So um, it's only increasing as you know our production of plastic increases worldwide. Um, 
Again, this is a, a image of a, a small whale, a pilot whale. It's a type of dolphin uh, that was found with 47 kilograms of plastic in its stomach. Um, this one stranded, I believe it was Thailand. Um, and of, again, the you know images like this, and may, many, maybe many of you have seen the image of the you know the the image that went viral of the turtle with the straw stuck up its nose. Um, <clears throat> but um, these animals and sea turtles in particular, um, it's estimated that every all sea turtles in the world ingest plastic um, or or will within the next 20 years. Um, this is 150 pieces of uh, plastic that were taken out of this um, juvenile sea turtle that was just, uh, I believe, a week or two weeks old. Um, it had just been it washed back in shore after be, after hatching off the Florida coast, um, and it already accumulated, um, you know, over 100 pieces of plastic in its stomach. And you know, looking from the size of this turtle, I don't know how I don't know how big the stomach of a turtle is, but my guess is it's not that big for the size, and that's a lot of that's a lot of plastic. And you can see here, what are these? These are our microplastics, right? They've come from bigger pieces. You can see some threads there as well. Um, can't say what they're from, you know, rope or fibers, but um, again, ingestion is certainly the most insidious um, problem for, for animals worldwide. And as I mentioned, nearly 300 animal species have been known to ingest uh, plastic. Um, but and what does that mean for us? As we know that it's in our bodies, it's leaving us through our waste. Uh, we certainly eat it when we, not just when we eat seafood, but pretty much, um, pretty much most of what we eat, we're probably ingesting plastic if we we use salt and water. And um, what what are the human health impacts? And this is the you know the, I guess the sixty four billion dollar question. Um, as I mentioned in 2011, uh, the the you know microplastics were just being known in the marine environment. Um, 2017, we knew that um, they are basically microplastics are getting into humans. Um, 2022, the paper was released about plastics being in our blood. But what does this mean for us? And if you read any of these papers, or if you read the um, the stories that are associated with the papers, the 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 journalist or whoever is writing the story always says the health impacts of of this are unknown. We don't know what it's doing to our bodies, but um, suffice it to say uh, that information is will be coming. That's um, a number of years ago. Um, the NIH was going to start looking at health impacts of plastic, but you know it's pretty safe to say that a foreign substance made of petroleum and petroleum-based products with lots of additives that are in our body are probably not a good thing for human health. Um, now, it may take a long time for that information to be distributed. Um, it may be um, just like um, cigarette, the dangers of cigarette information were held up for years um, by the tobacco industry. Uh, fossil fuel industry could certainly hold up this information or conduct, uh, you know, misinformation campaigns. but um, again, not being a health scientist, my guess is a petroleum-based product with additives floating around our bloodstream is probably not a good thing for our human health. Um, but that, again, that those those studies are being conducted, and they will be. Hopefully, we will be learning about that um, in the near future. Um, <clears throat> so, what does the future hold? I don't know why that picture. Sorry, the picture on the right um, always does that? I don't know. It was a vertical picture. I don't know why I changed the horizontal. But so um, unfortunately, um, one of these things that we've always heard from these conferences as well uh, that I've attended is that um, plastic is just, the production is just increasing. Um, in fact, it's supposed to increase. Um, well, this was in 2017 to 2025, it's supposed to increase fivefold. And to 2050, it's supposed to increase Increase tenfold from our 2017 levels. Um, so we are just pumping out new um, fresh plastic um, all the time. Uh, as you can see from this chart here, you can see that in the 70s and 80s and 90s, um, you know, there was less than 200 tons made. 
and now we're talking about um you know we're here close to 400 tons and by 2050 um a scaring one point um eight um million tons of plastic uh being produced and if countries do not have developed a waste uh, infrastructure to deal with this plastic, of course, more and more of this is just going to get into the environment. Uh, here's another um, another graph. Uh, this was a, a, a paper that came out. By 2050, we will have produced 26 metric tons of plastic. And you can see from um, this, this graph here that there will be more, um, according to this graph, there will be more plastic recycled. Um, but the the amount of waste that's entering our uh, our environment is certainly exponentially greater than it was um, in you know at the beginning of the of the this century the early two thousands and of course my first job was back here in the late eighties uh, working in a, a stop and shop in Orleans where we used to ask people you know this was the time of paper or plastic right and and I remember that everyone wanted paper bags, but they wanted the plastic bags to put you, they wanted the paper bags to go in the plastic bags so that they had handles to carry the paper bag. Um, I don't know why paper manufacturers didn't add the handles to the bags that would have maybe solved that problem. But um, we've certainly, we, we've, you know, where we are of, of 8 million tons entering the environment, which is certainly greater than that 2010 paper. Um, you know the the amount of production from 2010 to where we are today is is we've nearly doubled the amount of production. So certainly, what is entering our environment is much greater um, than eight million tons. Uh, and again, as it gets into the environment, it gets smaller, and um, it's more easily digestible, more easily um, it's possible for it to get into the air, um, in which as fibers in which we breathe it. Um, and of course, these, you know, this trend is not a positive trend um, when thinking about our environment. Um, so <clears throat> despite all this, you know, bad news and it's and certainly not good news, there, there are, you know, there are some things that we can do. Um, as I mentioned before, plastic is, you know, it is it's not a naturally occurring substance. We created it, um, we put it into the environment, and we let it get out there. Uh, so we can bring it back in. Um, so you can, you know, one helpful thing, and I've been I've been doing cleanups for the past 15 years. You know, one of the sad things is that the trash never stops. Uh, I can go out on any beach today and go pick up a bag of trash and probably go back next week and pick up another bag of trash. Um, but it does cleanups, whether on the beaches or whether in communities, because, you know, all streams or rivers eventually make their way to the sea and or, well, they all make their way to the sea. Um, I guess unless you live in the middle of Asia and they make their way to the inland sea, but most of them all make their way to the oceans. Uh, so cleanups uh, will at least stop plastic from getting into the oceans or plastic that's already in the ocean uh, from getting back into the ocean, and, and but more importantly, from breaking up into smaller pieces into microplastics, which are um, um, very um, detrimental and can be easily ingested. Um, I've had numerous times where I've picked up milk jugs or straws and just had them literally disintegrate in my hand. So the wave action, the sun action of being in the water will help break up plastic into, into smaller pieces, into microplastics. So cleanups can, can help in getting some of that plastic out of the environment, preventing it from becoming microplastics in the first place. Um, this is one solution, but of course it's not. It's not the uh, the solution, and I actually I forgot to put in the slide, but I uh, quite often it, when I talk about plastic pollution, and I um, I'm actually going to be talking to some high school kids later this week. Uh, you know, I asked them if we went to a house and you found that your bathtub was overflowing, uh, what's the first thing that you want to do? Um, and of course, the you know we can try any we can try many ways to sort of um to sort of try to mop up the water that's coming out of the bathtub but if we don't stop the flow of the water into the bathtub it's just going to keep coming and and when 
we're talking about plastic that flow of the bathtub has um, not only has it flown over the bathtub into the bathroom throughout our whole house it's it's now permeating permeating the cracks of the foundation of our house and that house of course is you know planet earth that we live on um, you can go pledge to go plastic free but of course this is nearly impossible right our, our world is filled with plastic um, you know and plastic isn't necessarily a bad thing um, because it has many important uses it's kind of the stupid plastics that we're talking about because if you remember from you know our top 10 list it's those plastics that were made to be used for a very very short period of time that are most prevalent in our environment um, Use your voice. Uh, I like to, um, to, to talk about this and, and, and that's really with whatever voice you have. We all have different voices. Um, I have a voice as an educator to tell you about this. Um, maybe there are artists out there, there's politicians, um, you know, there's teachers, there's, you know, we all have voices. We all have our own voice. Um, community leaders, we can all use our voice to try to change um, the impact of plastic pollution. Um, one voice uh, that a lot of people, I, I myself am also a photographer and I've done this as well, um, raising awareness with art. There's many, many projects out there using debris as art to raise awareness. Um, amazing stuff, some, some truly amazing artists just create um, just amazing, beautiful works. In fact, there's an artist working with debris that the center has collected. That will be, um, there'll be an installation. I don't think I can say what it is. I'm not sure, I th that might be a secret, but it will be revealed on World Ocean Day, June 8th at the Herring Cove Bathhouse. So if any of you are interested, it looks like it's going to be an amazing sculpture. Um, and I believe it will be there. I'm not sure how long it will stay up, but I believe through the summer at least. Um, so if you're artists, um, filmmakers, or you know any type of art, but we all have voices. We all have our own voice. Um, I like to highlight um, two two voices of of people I've met, um, and I don't know if there are any young folks out here listening today. Um, but as I mentioned, I'd be speaking to some high school students later this week, and I I quite often speak to students, um, and and I say that that. Adults do listen to younger folks. Um, this is a little, the, actually he's not little anymore. I think he's probably a junior in college, uh, but this was a boy named Milo Kress, uh, who I happened to meet um, when he was a sixth grader. He lived on the Cape. He was actually from the Cape and moved back to the Cape. He lived here for a time, but Milo started a Be Straw Free campaign. This is before kind of the, the big campaigns of using less straws. Um, he started it in his, home where he was living in Burlington, Vermont, and uh, he got restaurants there to um, stop using straws. He got towns eventually to stop using straws. He actually got Zantera, and this is a picture from, Zantera is the concessionaire for the U.S. Park Service in the Western states to stop using straws, um, all by this, this voice of a, you know, 10, 10 11 year old. Um, pretty amazing. Um, these two sisters, um, and I'm right now I'm, I'm blanking on their names, but these two sisters uh, started a campaign in Bali. Uh, they're from Bali um, to ban plastic bags. Um, Malati is the sister on the older sister, the one on the right. Um, and they, I believe, I actually haven't checked, but I believe after nearly five or six years of working, um, they were able finally to ban plastic bags on. Um, on the island of Bali. Um, the sister on the right, uh, this one right here, uh, attended the uh, 2017 conference, the Marine Debris Conference. She was 17 years old and she was on the stage at the end of the plenary session. Um, and I heard, you know, everyone in the stage saying that they wanted to be like her, right? She was, she was out there fighting for change using her voice. Um, we can use our money. And I'm just about finished here, wrapping up. So we can use our money on simple things, buying, you know, alternatives to things that, you know, everyday food, food items that we throw out, bottles, cutlery, uh, you know, plastic bags, shopping bags. 
um, or um, you know, Ziploc bags, these, these everyday items that we, we use once and we throw out, we can use our money um, in this simple way. Uh, we can use our money in a different way, uh, right? Shareholders of companies can lobby or attend shareholder meetings and ask them to change, you know, we can, you know, shareholders of Coca-Cola can ask Coca-Cola to change, you know, may, maybe make more recycling, more products with recycled material, um, Procter & Gamble, you know, these, these companies that, that have lots of different, well, Procter & Gamble has lots of different brands, you know, that all use plastic. Um, and of course, Dow, Dow is one of the biggest makers of these pre-industrial plastic in the world, I believe, in fact, it's the biggest maker in the world. And I've frozen, I don't know. I hope you can still hear me. Can you still hear me? We can still hear you, yes. Okay, good. And and finally, um, you know, my five R's um, that we can, we can think about um, in no particular order, you can use them in any order you like. Um, rethink, you know, rethink what we're making products out of to last forever for the use of refuse, refuse products that we don't need, right? You don't, you don't need that plastic bag to take your bottle of drink and chew from the, the convenience store to the car. Um, reduce, certainly reducing our, trying to reduce the amount of plastic we use. Redesign, um, there are many people out there looking at different, different products to use um, for plastic wrapping and packaging, Any, anything from um, eggs to fungi to algae, um, you know, redesign what we make, these, these products that we make, to, we make to be used one time, you know, make that amount of something that then will, will go away is natural. Um, repurpose, repurpose, um, you know, plastics that we do have. Uh, what you do notice in here is that what I don't have is I don't have the recycle. Recycle is the last thing because most of the most of what we throw into recycling bins, and you know I'm guilty of this as well. I went to the transfer station today and took recycling. Um, plastic recycling is most of it is not recycled. Um, it's either if it's lucky, it's downcycled, made into another plastic product, but has no end use. If it's uh, you know if it's not lucky, it gets incinerated. Um, or ship to another country that already has a waste management issue. Um, so again, we need really to rethink um, what we're using this type of plastic for that, that gets into the environment. And with that, I want to bring us back to this picture. Um, sorry, I didn't leave time. About five minutes for questions, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, and thank you for staying in today and listening to this presentation. Thank you, Jesse. That was amazing. So fascinating and, um, you know, terrifying. And but I'm, I'm really, really I'm glad that you um, answered what we could do, because um, that was going to be my main question is what can everybody do? But that was you did a wonderful job answering that. And that's, you know, something important that everyone here can take away, which is awesome. We can all be a part of helping to hopefully solve um, and work on solving that issue. Uh, one of the first questions we've got here is, um, how about ways to reduce medical waste, which is really huge as well? Um, it's that's a good question. I I do not know. I you know I don't I don't work in that field. Um, we do see we do see some medical waste that ends up on the beaches. Mm -hmm. um, and and certainly during COVID, right? We're starting to see more PPE wash. You know that that has now become. We now have a new chart on our data sheets for PPE, which we didn't have before because we didn't used to find face masks on any cleanups, but we do now. Um, I I can't really speak to that because I don't I don't know. Um, but I, having been in the hospital in the fall for surgery, I know the I was blown away, you know blown away by how much waste that that must have generated my hospital stay um it it is pretty mind-boggling but i i can't answer that unfortunately because i don't really know much about that but i know it's it has to be enormous right just i was in the hospital for a couple of days and it was just it's amazing what what gets used every right. time someone comes in to see you <laughs> exactly and when you think about how some hospitals have you know hundreds of beds 
um, and outpatient facilities as well and all that it can really add up um, and, and this is in a country where we actually have good waste management exactly I imagine a lot of that stuff gets incinerated but I'm not sure but uh, you know and you know as opposed to countries that don't have good waste management mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so uh, another comment someone had a comment that says plastic does not have a life cycle plastic only has a death cycle plastic doesn't have a life cycle it only has a death cycle i guess that's true right mm -hmm. from it mm -hmm. it starts it starts degrading as soon as you, you get it yes right right yeah what one of the things, you know, one of the as you and you, as you see from the data, you know, and it's not just what we collect here on Cape Cod. It's it's and what the Ocean Conservancy, you know, most of most of what gets out into the environment is this is this you know disposable plastic that has an easy shelf life or quick shelf life. But you don't find lots of we don't find lots of cell phones on beach cleanups. Um, you know, we don't find valuable pieces of plastic typically. We do find some strange things that are, you know, have a long use life, but we don't find lots of long use plastic. Um, and it's this, you know, the idea of the, the, the plastic that's with a short death, I guess, with a very short life, that that's what we find most of. And that's what, and honestly, that's the easiest to change, right? Mm -hmm. That is because there are there are ready alternatives to, to some of that stuff. There's ready alternatives for bags, for straws, for, um, you know, cups. You there's there's alternatives to these things. Um, you know, you can make we don't do it in this country, but you can, you know, in other European countries, they actually take recycled, you know, bottles and and refill them, right? Clean them and refill them. So you can you can do this. Uh, we tend to use virgin plastic to make new bottles because it's it's easier and cheaper. And um, and we don't in in those countries, particularly uh, Denmark, they you know there's a law that makes it responsible to bring back the plastic to the the the, the producer is responsible for bringing it back and creating more recycled content. We don't have those laws in this country, mm -hmm. um, but but you know from what gets into the environment, this really easily use quickly use disposable you know disposable plastic there there are many alternatives and th that's what we need to to address um, another question is if you're planning on organizing your own sort of ad hoc beach cleanup if you're going to the beach or your own vacation what would what would you recommend people bring with them so um, one of the things is is try not to create more waste when you're doing a beach cleanup, then so you know, try to bring like a reusable container. Um, we for our our cleanup cleanups, we use quite we use sort of the the five gallon buckets. Those are good, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can just dump the empty them into a trash. Uh, I like the blue IKEA bags myself because they have handles. You can carry a lot of stuff in them. Um, uh, have gloves, you know, your own gloves, so you're not you don't have plastic, you know, plastic gloves. Another thing, another waste. Um, so try to reduce your waste for beach cleanup. I remember the first, very first ocean cleanup I went on, like in 2005, you know, we were all handed plastic gloves and we all had a trash bag that we filled like a quarter of the trash bag. And then all those trash bags got thrown out. It's like, well, that's a waste of trash bags. So, um, so yeah, reducing, reducing your waste in cleaning up the beach is, is one thing to, you know, mm -hmm. one thing to do. Mm -hmm. And what do you guys do when you find sort of hazardous waste? Like I'm thinking needles or something like that. Do you have, do you call somebody or? So we, we, I quite often can carry, uh, or carry a Sharpie container okay. um, that I just get from the fire station. So needles okay. and things we, you can take to the fire stations. Um, so once I have a kind of collection of those, I'll take those to the fire station, but any like a bottle, you know, if you find a bottle, you can throw it in a bottle or a yogurt container is a good container mm -hmm. for, for needles. Um, yeah, you just want to be, we do find needles quite often. We find one or two needles mm -hmm. on a cleanup. Um, after big storms, we actually, the because the, a lot of the trash that washes into Cape comes from off Cape. And at, um, Elizabeth and I were talking about how we really haven't had big bad winters for a while on the Cape, but um, you know, 2015, for example, was a really snowy winter. Um, we had, we, 
snowy or winters, particularly around Boston, we get lots and lots and lots of trash coming up to Cape. And we'll find more needles. We'll find, you know, I, I, I've picked up numerous parking tickets from places in Boston. And <laughs> because a lot of times in really snowy winters, and I know in 2015 this happened, there's so much snow, there's so much snow that they just push, right? They just plow the snow into the water right. because there was no place to put it. Like it piled up, piled up. So they literally just pushed the snow into the water. Of course, all the stuff that's on the street that's in that snow went right into the water with it. So we see um, particularly beaches like Herring Cove, Race Point, um, and Provincetown, because that's kind of the, the, the bay sort of curves around counterclock. Mm -hmm. The currents in the bay kind of go around counterclockwise and it, stuff gets spit out there after big winters, particularly we might not have snow, much snow down on the Cape, but in Boston, they have big snowstorms. We'll see a, a whole bunch of trash. Um, yeah, we'll see a lot of trash washing up. Wow. So we've got a comment here that says, I reused the 50-pound onion slash potato bags obtained from the supermarkets. Yeah, so those are good. Or beer, um, the, uh, like you can get sacks, beer sacks too. Like they right. the, sometimes breweries have them. Yeah. Um, that It's another good. I like... I, you know, I had to buy the Ikea bags, but they have handles. That's why I like them mm -hmm. where, you know, the buckets also have the handles. So anything, again, anything that you're reducing your weight, you know, just so you're not taking a right a little traffic bag to fill up a quarter of way. And we usually at the end, we, we consolidate everything into like big contractor bags mm -hmm. so that it's full, you know, so we're throwing away maybe one bag of trash as opposed to 10 little bags of trash. So Right. And how often do you and the Center for Coastal Studies do these beach cleanups? So, um, as I said, last year, so last year um, we did about 25 cleanups. Um, mm -hmm. Or were involved with, we, we didn't lead all those cleanups. Um, some, um, for example, there's a cleanup that in October that's the whole outer Cape. And mm -hmm. we're not the lead on that cleanup, but we participated and we collected data from that cleanup. Mm -hmm. um, so roughly one one a month we're leading. Um, now our our plastic pollution program. Um, she had a staff member last summer, so she did a couple more cleanups in the summer. And I don't know if she's going to have a staff member this summer to do that. Um, but roughly once a month, uh, we have we have two coming up around Earth Day. Um, I know and. Uh, we had, we had just one, the le last one we did was, um, Valentine's day. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, the next two coming up that I'm aware of are, are two on earth day. That's, that's a great idea. Um, uh, earth day is a great time of year to be, you know, taking care of our mother earth and mother nature. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, if there's no other questions, um, I think that's probably it for the day. Um, I do quickly want to remind everybody that our next lecture is Sunday, March 19th, uh, 2.30 p.m. again, and it will be via Zoom, and that is with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Um, we're going to be learning about the latest in white shark research, so that is going to um, be coming up soon. And um, again, please don't be a stranger. Check out our website. Check out the website for Center for Coastal Studies as well um, to check out their upcoming schedule for beach walks like this. And Jesse, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an awesome afternoon. Um, I've learned a lot and got, that's, that's the mission of these types of lectures. Um, so thank you, Jesse, and thank you to everybody that's come. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And, uh, and yeah, folks, check out the website for upcoming cleanups. Fabulous. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.